Well, good evening, everybody. It is uh, a privilege for me to be able to speak to you again. Uh, my name is Paul, and I'm talking to you here from Belfast. I'm very glad for all who have uh, joined and uh, are prepared to listen to the message of the gospel. I'm going to read to you uh, some words from the Bible found in the book of Acts and chapter 17. And uh, we're coming in just at the tail end of a message that Paul the Apostle preached in the city of Athens. And in verse 30, he says, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them, Dionysius the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. History is full of unsolved mysteries and unanswered questions. There are events that took place uh, years ago, and uh, the facts have been covered over by the sands of time and buried far too deeply for any of us really to get at so that the real truth of the matter will forever be shrouded in mystery and uncertainty. And then many of these uh, unsolved mysteries and unanswered questions are mere curiosities anyway. I mean, if we ever got down to the truth of the matter, it really wouldn't make much difference to our lives anyway. Some people might just be thinking that the events of that first Easter Sunday are maybe a wee bit like that. Some people might be thinking, what evidence really is there? Could we ever really know what happened? And others might be saying, even if we did know, what difference does it make to us anyway? It happened so long ago and so far away, surely there's no relevance to us today. Well, I would like to tell you this afternoon that uh, there is a huge amount of evidence for what happened that first Easter Sunday, and also there is a huge amount of relevance. And that's what I want us to think about for this message. Let's think, first of all, about the evidence. Now, with the time available to us, obviously, we can't get into all the evidence, but what I want to draw to your attention is something that is absolutely not at all controversial, something that is agreed to by all ancient historians, whether Christian or non-Christian, and it is this one single fact. That is, the disciples of Jesus claimed to have been with the risen Jesus. Now, as I say, that is not controversial. That is something that is multiply, independently attested to, both within the New Testament and outside the New Testament, that the disciples claimed to have been with the risen Jesus. Jesus. All ancient historians would acknowledge that to be the case. It's virtually unanimously agreed upon. Now, the thing is this, and this, this also is not controversial, the disciples were either right or wrong about their claim. Uh, you can see that I've been thinking this matter through very deeply. They were either right or wrong about their claim to have been with the risen Jesus. Now, if they were wrong, then there are only two options. Either they thought they were right, but made a mistake, or they knew they were wrong and were telling lies. 
But the thing is, neither of those two options are possible. Uh, they couldn't have been sincerely mistaken about this uh, because their, their claim wasn't that one misty morning or one stormy night across the street and down the road they saw someone the same size and build as Jesus of Nazareth and they jumped to the conclusion that's him he must be risen no their claim was that they were actually with him uh, on multiple occasions as individuals and as groups uh, they listened to his teaching they saw the wounds they handled the body they ate meals with him this is not something that you can just be sincerely mistaken about there's no way you can just get that wrong. Uh, so there's no way they could have been sincerely mistaken about this, and there's no way they would have been deliberately lying. These were God-fearing Jews. There's no way they ever would have dared invent this story that the crucified carpenter was actually the risen Son of God, equal with God the Father, worthy of worship, the fulfillment of the sacrifices, uh, the end of the ceremonies. There's no way God-fearing Jews ever would have dared invent such a story. And also, uh, there's no way anyone with an ounce of common sense ever would have dared invent such a story. Uh, children very early in life learn, if I could call it this, the, the first rule of lying. And that is you lie to get yourself out of trouble, not to get yourself into trouble. Uh, people invent stories for their benefit, but all the disciples got from their story was persecution and imprisonment and isolation and hardship and toil and for many martyrdom uh, that's not the kind of thing that you invent and uh, when people therefore look at these two options open-mindedly and honestly where we have to recognize this that neither of these two options is possible the disciples couldn't have been deceived the disciples were not deceivers they weren't sincerely mistaken they weren't deliberately lying which means that they weren't wrong and if they weren't wrong that means that they were right, that the Lord really did rise from the dead. But what relevance does that have to us? Well, a, a lot. Let me just mention two ways in which it's relevant. First of all, the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead means then that salvation is a necessity. He claimed to be the Son of God. That's why the Jewish leaders uh, rejected him and wanted him to be crucified. If he were not the Son of God, he couldn't have raised himself from the dead, and God wouldn't have raised him from the dead. The fact that he is risen from the dead is God's seal of approval on the claims Jesus Christ made for himself. And it is therefore God's stamp of authority on all that Jesus taught. Uh, the resurrection from the dead shows that everything that Jesus says comes with all the authority of God, which means then that when he says that we're all sinners, that we're all guilty, that none of us is good, and that we can't earn God's favor, we can't say, well, who are you to judge? He is the judge. Uh, when he says that uh, there is a real hell, uh, and that because of our sin, that's where we're going. We can't dismiss that as the rantings of some madman. No, the resurrection from the dead shows that these are solemn statements of sober fact, uttered in deepest compassion by the one who knew what lay ahead of those who do not have their sins forgiven. When he says that, we must be born again. And unless we're born again, we can't enter God's kingdom. 
We can't dismiss that as uh, some bigoted, narrow-minded view. When he says, I am the way, the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father but by me. His resurrection from the dead is God's stamp of authority on that claim to be the exclusive way of salvation. So maybe maybe you have been uh, going along in your life thinking that uh, the life you live is good enough to get you to heaven. The things you've done are enough to earn God's favor. Well, just remember this. Jesus Christ disagreed with you. Jesus Christ taught the opposite. He says all of us are sinners. He says every one of us is in need of salvation. He said because of the wrong we've done, we are lost and in danger of perishing forever. And his resurrection from the dead shows that his view is God's view. And what that means then is salvation is a necessity. But his resurrection from the dead also proves that salvation is a possibility. You see, before he died, he said he was going to die. He was going to give his life in order to pay the penalty for sin. He says that's why he came. He says, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. Sin's penalty must be paid. That's why religion cannot save us. That's why good works cannot save us. The wrong that we've done must be answered for. The crimes we've committed, uh, the penalty has to be paid. And so the only way we can escape is if there's one able and willing to pay that penalty for us. Well, that's why the Son of God came in to the world. That's why the Lord Jesus went to the cross. On the cross, he gave himself into the hands of God to take the punishment that sinners deserved, to make the payment that God's justice demanded. And his resurrection from the dead is the proof and the proclamation that the penalty has been fully paid. He died to pay the price, and because the price was paid, death couldn't hold him, the grave couldn't keep him, and the Lord Jesus rose from the dead. And what that means then is salvation is available to any and to all. God's justice has been satisfied. The barrier between mankind and God is removed, and anyone and everyone can be saved. And anyone and everyone will be saved if they come to the Lord Jesus and trust in him for salvation, if they come to him and make him their only hope and their only plea before God, if they will give up their works and rest on what he has done for their salvation, if they do that, then they enter into peace with God and the assurance of heaven at the end of life. Uh, it's a wonderful thing that the Lord Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. It is relevant to you and to me today. It means salvation is a necessity. You must be saved, but it means that salvation is a possibility. You may be saved. There is hope for you. There's a Savior who is able and he is available. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you turn to him, and trust him with your soul. Trust him for your salvation. His promise is that he will never let you perish and he will give you new life and peace with God. Why don't you take him up on his promise? Why don't you trust him with your soul? Why don't you turn to him for forgiveness and for salvation? If you do, you'll never regret it. Thank you for listening.